you wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest. podcast in the world. In the world. The Chris Voss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. The CEOs, authors, thought leaders, visionaries, and motivators. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host. Chris Voss. Hi, folks. This is Voss here from the Chris Voss Show.com. The Chris Voss Show.com. Welcome to the big show, my friends. We certainly appreciate you guys tuning in. Remember, the Chris Voss Show is the family that loves you but doesn't judge you, at least not as harshly as your mother in law. So go clean your room. Uh, anyway, guys. <laughs> As always, refer the show to your family, friends, and relatives. YouTube.com for it says Chris Voss. Goodreads.com for it says Chris Voss. All the LinkedIn groups and all that great stuff there. Uh, we have an amazing journalist and author on the show with us today. He's going to be talking about his newest book called The Secret Files. Bill de Blasio, the NYPD, and the Broken Promises of Police Reform. Michael Hayes is on the show with us today. It's about his amazing new book. It'll be coming out February 21st, 2023. You can pre-order wherever fine books are sold. Stay away of those alley bookstores. It's a great way to get mugged when you're trying to buy a book. I'm just kidding. I'm sure they're nice. Anyway, guys, Michael Hayes has reported on the policies and practices of police departments in America covering major criminal trials across the country, including the death penalty cases of the Boston Bomber and Charleston Church shooter Dylan Roof. He's written about everything from mass shootings to presidential elections. In 2019, he was named a finalist for the prestigious Livingston Award for Young Journalists and Deadline Club Award for his investigative journalist reporting on the NYPD's secret disciplinary files. Michael's work has been appeared in a wide range of outlets, including ProPublica, BuzzFeed News, HuffPost, The Appeal, Gotham CNN, and uh, WNYC. Uh, Michael grew up in New England and went to college at Fordham University in the Bronx, New York. He lives in New Jersey with his wife, uh, Ryan. And their two sons, Caleb and Elliot. Uh, No dog, no cat there, uh, Michael. What's going on? Uh, No pets yet. I've got, uh, as you just mentioned, Chris, two (laughs) young boys who are like puppies I cannot train. So, Oh, there you go. Well, that's that's young boys for you. But, uh, yeah, it's funny because some people put their their dogs or cats or whatever their animals are in their bio, and sometimes it's kind of interesting. I think we had an author one time raising a raccoon. Welcome to the show, Michael. Congratulations on the new book, my friend. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks for that incredible intro. That was awesome. Well, it was your bio. It wasn't mine. So that was there. <laughs> anyway, uh, give us your dot coms wherever you want people to look you up on the interwebs and find out more about you. Sure. So I have a personal website, michaelhayes.bio, and uh, you can find me on Twitter. Just my name, Michael Hayes. There you go. There you go. So what motivated you to write this book, Michael? Uh, we, we'd like to hear from your words, if you would, please. Sure. So uh, as you mentioned, uh, I did a lot of reporting a couple of years back on the NYPD's uh, secret disciplinary system. And when I got the opportunity to write this book uh, a couple of years after that initial round of reporting, uh, I thought it sounded like a good opportunity to see um, how they've been doing since we revealed some uh, unkind facts about how they've been running their disciplinary system. And uh, the book is titled uh, The Secret Files, Bill de Blasio, the NYPD, and the Broken Promises of Police Reform. And, you know, that really, in a nutshell, describes what I found, uh, broken promises. Uh, After Eric Garner was killed in uh, 2014, police accountability in New York City really became the issue for the de Blasio administration. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that happened in no small part because the mayor himself said that he would use this tragedy to transform the NYPD into a department that was more transparent and accountable to New Yorkers. And uh, what I found is that because of politics, the awesome power of the NYPD, the city fell short and continues to do so when it comes to holding police who commit the most egregious misconduct accountable for their actions from a 30,000 view. And, and this is your beat. I mean, you, you cover this a lot. Why, why is it we can't get this fixed? I mean, we just, we've just seen the recent, uh, 
I, I would call it a murder, in my opinion, of uh, Tyree Nichols, of the four uh, Memphis police officers uh, beating him to death. Why Why can't we get a handle on this? Is it just, is it politics? Is it people, you know, don't care what happens as long as it's on their backyard? Or why, why is it? Um, that's a really good question. One, you know, I get all the time after, you know, the latest tragedy, people like to ask, you know, is anything good going to happen here? And, uh, you know, uh, uh, I'm, I've been known to, to, to be cynical about it and to say, you know, some of these levers of power, specifically uh, the police unions are um, too powerful and, and really reform needs to start there if we're ever going to have major change. I will say that another thing I've, I I've found while doing this book, and I hope it comes through when people get a chance to read it, is that there really is a story of hope here in mm. terms of uh, how activists can coalesce and, and, and get something changed. Uh, specifically in the case of, of uh, the story of the secret files, we had a, a law in New York uh, that stood on the books for 40 years that made all police disciplinary records uh, completely secret. And uh, after George Floyd was killed in 2020, the New York state legislature repealed that law, but it didn't happen overnight. It was really thanks to a decade long fight uh, by these networks of, of activists in New York that are, are mostly led by black and brown women who have had their sons and loved ones killed by the police. Um, they were able to, to bring uh, uh, politicians of, of different shapes and sizes together to, mm-hmm. to, to get that law repealed. And so that stands, you know, uh, you ask, when are we going to get this right? I would, I would uh, advocate that that's, you know, one major example right there. So there is yeah. hope. It's just a matter of, of, Constantly, uh, you know, accountability, uh, the, you guys being the fourth estate uh, with the journalism, you know, calling it out, doing Pfizer quests, et cetera, et cetera. So, so the secret files from the title of the book, is that what it refers to, those 40 years of secret files that uh, are now uncovered by the legislature? So so my specific secret files and, and uh, the, the secret files that I focus on in the, in the book are these 2,000 secret NYPD police disciplinary records that I got my hands on wow. back in, in 2018 and, and really set this whole line of reporting off for me personally. When I was working at BuzzFeed, myself and another, another reporter uh, were able to obtain uh, records on about 1,800 officers. And this is when they were, before that law I just mentioned was repealed and, and they were completely uh uh, hidden from public view. Um, so those are the, those are the, the specific secret files mm. from the book. But you're not too far off when you say, yeah, 40, 40 years of, of secret police discipline. There you go. Um, so you, you start the book out with the uh, murders of the two police officers that were ambushed in New York City. Um, and uh, was there a reason you focus on Bill de Blasio and maybe didn't go back to you know, Giuliani stop for a sort of era, the things that were going on there. So, so I do flick back to the Giuliani years, um, even more prominently in the, in the book, flick back to the years of, uh, Mayor David Dinkins, who mm-hmm. was, uh, uh, a major mentor for, for Bill de Blasio. He worked for Dinkins and he really started his rise in New York City politics uh, during the Dinkins years. Um, but I wanted to to focus on um, this most recent era because, as I, as I said on the top, I, I really believe that, that it was a, a moment in time where um, – police accountability and, and, and police reform was the issue in in New York uh, mm-hmm. during those years. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the issues, I mean, you know, you go back to Serpico and what, the 70s. I mean, it just seems like a, a, a clown car, never ending problems. Uh, I know the unions, the, the power of the unions and, of course, the voting power, you know, getting the endorsement to become mayor and stuff uh, was an issue. I remember, and you, I believe you talk about it in your book. I remember when Bill De Blasio uh, first took office, uh, him and the him and the police department turned were at odds. In fact, wasn't there a one of one of his first meetings? Didn't they all turn their back on him, or am I thinking of someone else? 
So yeah, just to, to clean that up a bit, you're not too far off there, Chris. You you mentioned the, the murders of officers Ramos and Lou. Um, those happened in December of, of uh, 2014, so about uh, uh, five months after Eric Garner was killed. And this all happened in the first year that uh, uh, de Blasio was in office. And I really want to, to write about these early events to convey just how much he had on his plate in terms of uh, policing uh, from the onset of his administration. Um, so, uh, uh, but to go back to what you were saying about um, uh, when the officers turned their back on him, that happened on three occasions that week or in the, in the uh, um, few weeks after those officers were, were killed. Um, the first time being at the hospital that night as the mayor was showing up with his police commissioner to meet the families, to get an update on the officer's uh, condition, just to just really the first time that uh Mayor de Blasio was thrust into the chaos of that situation as he's walking the halls of the hallway. Uh, uh, several officers led by police union president Pat Lynch literally turned their back on de Blasio mm-hmm. and uh, which got, a, which got a lot of press in New, in New York city and uh, fast forward, not to uh, about a, a week later at the first funeral for one of the officers, I believe it was Officer Ramos's funeral that happened first. Uh, thousands of officers in the street who were watching the mayor speak on a, on a jumbotron inside uh, the church during the services turned their back on, on the, the jumbotron and ostensibly turned their back on the mayor. And uh, the same thing happened yet again. Uh, at the other officer's funeral, um, which is interesting because between the two funerals, the commissioner of the of, of the NYPD, Bill Bratton, came out and said, "Don't do that again." And uh, uh, again, led by the led by the police unions, um, the officers decided to send that message for literally a third time uh, in a week. Wow! And it seems like. I mean, it seems like these police unions and police standards, you, you hear about these police officers that can be disciplined or do something very heinous. They get fired from a police department, and then they can just go down the block to the next city police department and easily get picked up. I imagine because they have experience in the job, but still the the disciplinary measures they got someplace else don't. They can just hop from city to city. They're almost kind of like Catholic priests where they just, you know, they just move them around and, oh, and it was pedophile? Okay, well, put them over there in Philadelphia or something. You know, it's it's uh, it's kind of interesting, the, the, the laws and the protection that they have. And uh, But then again, you know, you have um, – it is a factor the fact that people don't want to – actually do something they actually just kind of throw to the police to clean up the mess and and they just as long as it's not in my backyard and i don't have to deal with it you know clean up the riffraff or you know that's their thinking is that is that uh you know let them handle the 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 dirty parts of whatever humanity to clean up uh you know uh, people that are maybe homeless and stuff like that uh you know we've seen all this we've seen all this stuff going and i'm, I'm not saying that i'm saying there's kind of this attitude of the as long as it's not my backyard I don't, I don't care what happens sort of thing. I don't know. That's an interesting point. Another, another interesting point I think you allude to there is this attitude of, of throwing things to the police and, mm-hmm. and our expectations of what the police should be left to deal with. And I would, I would argue that a large reason, a big reason that that is such a pervasive attitude in society is that a lot of uh, leaders talk that way uh give you a current example the the current mayor of new york city mayor eric adams has been very vocal about the need to be tougher on crime the need for more police and more um tougher police tactics in order to deal with uh as he perceives it just rising rampant crime so when you have somebody in a position of power uh, uh, talking like that and not just, you know, in his, you know, speeches and press releases, you can go on cable news and promote that message any, any day of the week. Uh, it, it trickles down through society. And, and I think uh, in a way it does uh, a huge disservice to 
police because it, it just it puts it, it, it makes their job probably harder than it should be. Definitely. I mean, you talk about that in your book, the election of uh, Mayor Adams and and his sort of hard line. You know, a lot of these politicians, they love that banging on that thing. We've had a lot of authors on that have talked about, you know, starting with Nixon and through Reagan, the, the rule of law, quote unquote, sort of attitude. And like I mentioned earlier, you know, uh, there was discussions during after George Floyd about how, you know, maybe we need to rework the police. Maybe the police shouldn't be showing up for homeless people and other social ills that maybe a psychiatrist should be showing up for. Um, and, you know, it doesn't seem like that got very much traction. Uh, you know, you're seeing the fallout of, of a, uh, of a, of a very liberal, uh, DA in San Francisco and how crazy that's gotten out of hand. I got friends that live in San Francisco and by no means am I on the other side of that where I'm like, you know, we need more law and order. There needs to be a balance somewhere, but I think somewhere that let off just a little too lightly or something. I don't know, but it's out of control out there. Right. So, um, so in the secret files that you, you found, um, how are you finding, uh, that sort of things, uh, plays out in the rest of, uh, nationally, uh, with police economy or accountability and reform? Sure. So, um, uh, my book focuses on what went down in New York again, decades long mm-hmm. fight that culminated with this law being stricken off the books and, and things, uh, at least in writing, becoming more transparent, a big, a big, uh, part of the, of the last part of the book, I focus on how after that law uh, was repealed in New York, the NYPD still is uh, keeping a lot of stuff secret. But to to um, to answer your question about how this reflects nationally, so we've seen a lot of progress nationally um, uh, in terms of uh, police discipline and transparency. Um, I, I believe. Uh, 19 states um, now have uh, pretty open records, and that's up from uh, uh, almost double in the last uh, five or so years, thanks to states like New York, California, changing their laws. Um, at the same time, um, you know, it's very, uh, it's still very hard to, to, to learn about this stuff. Uh, uh, case in point, we were talking about Tyree Nichols before, Chris, and, uh, you know, in Tennessee, uh, a lot of people, myself included, are interested to know um, those officers who beat Tyree Nichols to death. What were their misconduct histories at the Memphis Mm. Police Department? Uh, I tried to put in a public records request myself. Uh, As you mentioned, I'm living in New Jersey with my my two crazy kids and my my wife, and uh, uh, my request was immediately denied uh, for that because I don't live in the state of Tennessee. So that's the, that just, you know, gives you one example of how these laws are, are, are maybe, I, I would argue still a little backwards. Why, why should I have to live in the state of Tennessee to learn about the officers who, yeah. who, who beat up Tyree Nichols? Um, that's the, uh, that's, that's, that kind of makes sense. Can they refuse like some of the big newspapers that are based in other states, you know, can they refuse those as well? Or, uh, have a unless, they, unless they have somebody who lives in, in Tennessee, I can tell you, I don't think I'm speaking out of school here to tell you that there are mm-hmm. some uh, uh, journalists um, in the state of Tennessee, in the city of Memphis, mm-hmm. um, uh, folks that work with the commercial appeal, the big paper down there, as well as the University of Memphis, who um, uh, have been requests for this stuff, who... who clearly can get at least get over that first hurdle of, of living, you know, within, the, within the state boundaries. So, but we'll see what happens. Um, yeah. You know, if, if, if you want to drill down a little more in Tennessee, I've seen, I've also seen stories where they've char- tried to charge somebody anywhere from 1700 to $6,000 to obtain police disciplinary files, which is, wow. Uh, you know, not money that most uh, uh, journalists have lying around to try to uh, to uh, learn about stuff for stories. So, uh, yeah, it's going to be interesting um, uh, to see if we if we if we learn anything there. There you go. I mean, this this seems like a dumb question, but I mean, you're the expert in this field. Um, do you find that most of these these uh, incidents that we find that rise to the na- level of national media attention for something extraordinary or horrific, like uh, like the Tyrese Nichols case or George Floyd, um, do you find that I mean, 
nine times out of 10 or majority of the time that these people, you know, this is a ramp up from someone who's had lots of disciplinary issues and they just finally, they just finally, you know, did the, did the worst thing they possibly could. And, and they were on this trajectory. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I mean, uh, to say that it's most, um, uh, you know, I, I, I wouldn't argue with you there because, you know, you bring up that point. I immediately can think of a couple right off the top of my head. The biggest example being the officer who, who killed Eric Garner, uh, mm-hmm. was never convicted of, of, of murder. So we can't say murder here. Um, but he, he killed Eric Garner by putting him in a chokehold. Um, uh, speaking about former NYPD officer, Daniel Pantaleo, uh, it came out, um, shortly after that, that he had a a poor disciplinary background at the NYPD, had uh, way more complaints than your average officer and had been um, disciplined, had been found guilty uh, of misconduct uh, several times. Uh, Another famous example, um, uh, Derek Chauvin, the officer who murdered George Floyd and was convicted of murder. Um, It, uh, was revealed, I, I believe, within days of that incident, thanks to some uh, uh, good, transparent, open record laws uh, in the state of Minnesota, it was revealed within days that he had an egregious uh, background of, um, you know, over a dozen uh, complaints against him of, of violating the civil rights of, of people in that state. So, yeah, I mean, uh, where there's smoke, there's fire. Yeah. Does, 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 does people need to, and and what I was kind of referring to earlier is, you know, people won't convict, uh, juries won't convict officers, uh, unless it's really heinous. I mean, I remember watching the body language of, of the officer, I forget his name and I don't care who killed, he can die, he can die nameless, um, who killed George Floyd. Uh, I remember watching him in shock, the body language of him being in shock that he really thought he was going to get off on that one. And that they convicted him. At least that was my interpretation of his body language. He seemed completely in shock that he was not going to get off. And I know a lot of police officers do that are in these situations. You know, you mentioned uh, Garner and, and, and others. Um, that they get off and they survive jury trials. And juries don't seem to be busy to commit. Do we Do we need, as a, just as a people and as a populace, say enough with this bullshit? Is that, is that really where it needs to lie or does it? I mean, does it need to be more in the politicians we elect to clean up the the departments? Well, there is. I mean, there is something. If, if we if we truly want to decide that uh, that's our attitude, enough with this bullshit. There is a, uh, um, you know, there there is a mechanism here. Uh, there's this thing called qualified immunity that. Um, without yeah. going into nuts and bolts of it. And I've spent exactly zero days in law school. So I don't want to, uh, <laughs> you, you're better off asking a lawyer to give you the 45 minute version. I'll just say that this is, is um, a law uh, that really does exactly what it, what it says it does. It, it, it provides immunity for officers um, when something tragic happens on the job and it makes it, it, it at the at the federal level, it's a tremendous hurdle um, to bring criminal charges against officers. I will say that, um, uh, and I write about in the book, and and this was another big reason I wanted to do this book. I uh, the handful of NYPD killings that I write about in the book, I I, I follow um, the civil cases in in every one of those instances, and it's it's no exaggeration to say that if you're loved one is is killed by the police at least in new york city you're going to spend a decade fighting uh in a civil case uh and probably end up with some some incomplete justice where a the officer personally or officers are are not held uh in any way accountable and your your only real mechanism for justice is uh, uh a payment of of damages or or a settlement um, which could be in the millions of dollars, but that money that is uh, uh, the taxpayers of New York in the, in the case of the NYPD are, are footing the bill there. 
That's what that's what always strikes me about this whole thing where uh, it seems like Americans just kind of have this dismissive nature of it, uh, you know, out of sight, out of mind, uh, you know, keep the dredges of society away from me. And I don't really want to know how you make the sausage, just uh, keep the streets clean or, you know, whatever their attitude is um, that that. The, the kind of makes dis, makes it dismissive of this, and the only reason anybody cares every now and then is something so horrific and heinous that's extraordinary. You know, watching George Floyd was basically a lynching. I had someone come on the show, and they're like, "That really was a modern day lynching." When you really think about how he was strangled to death, um, and uh, you know, people people don't seem you know they people will care about it for a little while, and then it'll move on, and there'll be one next week or next month. And you look at the millions of dollars that these cities put out in settlements and, and payments, and you would think that after a certain time, either taxpayers or cities would come to the conclusion that, you know, for all the money we pay for this shit, maybe we should get rid of these officers, quit circulating between precincts, quit defending them, quit backing them up. Maybe we need to, uh, maybe we need to, you know, change it up. Yeah, and I mean, in, I think in order for that to happen, there just there needs to be more transparency. Mm-hmm. That's why it was such a, a a major deal in New York when uh, the police secrecy law was repealed, and the NYPD came out and said, "Okay," or or I should say, the mayor came out and said, "The NYPD is going to do something historic. They're going to publish all their disciplinary records," um, and the NYPD uh, agreed to do that. Uh, I should say they they agreed to do it after they lost multiple lawsuits uh, driven mm-hmm. by their by their unions, um, uh, and it it looked like it was going to be a, a a really major thing. But as I report in the book, uh, I was able to find um, a year after that happened uh, over a hundred missing examples of really egregious misconduct. Dozens wow. of officers who had been found guilty of of lying within the department. Uh, Their records were missing. Uh, Officers who beat people up, their records were missing. Officers who who threatened to kill somebody, uh, their records were missing. Um, And I'm not a data uh, scientist. I uh, had a couple spreadsheets, and I had the the files I got when I was working at BuzzFeed, and I did a – spent a good chunk of time comparing those two, but – you know, somebody with much more savvy data analyst skills can probably go in and find, uh, you know, what, the to- totality of, of what's missing there. Yeah, that or that or the stuff that's missing is probably so heinous. Somebody, you know, somebody uh, in probably in a fireplace, maybe. I don't know. Uh, I don't know. I'm just I, I have no idea. Um, so you get to, into the book. Uh, you go deep in the protests in the city after George Floyd was killed. And uh, Bill de Blasio preparing to leave office. Uh, what were some of the things that you found when you looked in that period of summer of 2020? Yeah, so I, I, I focused there as, as kind of a bookend on the de Blasio administration. He obviously stayed in, 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 uh, uh, in power for a little bit after that. But um, yeah, the protests uh, on the surface, they, they, they show the failure to rein the, the police in. We all saw it with our own eyes, uh, police beating and pepper spraying and, and falsely arresting people in the street. Um, but w- one uh, stat that I report in the book that I think kind of puts a nice bow on this is uh, 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 after those protests, you know, there numerous lawsuits were filed with dozens and dozens of, of people, um, protesters who uh, claiming that they were beaten, pepper sprayed and falsely arrested. And those lawsuits are ongoing and, and will be for some time. You can have me back on in like 2033 <laughs> and we'll talk about the resolution of the George Floyd protest lawsuits. Um, but But one thing I was able to find in my reporting was that uh, at the very end of the Blasio administration, they settled with more than 200 people, 200 protesters who who claimed to have been beaten um, uh, or and had their civil rights violated in other ways at the protests. Um, How, did you see – Settled did, out of court and, and – mm-hmm. yeah, sure. Go ahead. Sorry about that. The the audio broke up, and I thought you were finished. Um, did you see? You know, we've 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 talked a lot about racism 
uh, since George Floyd's murder and, and had a lot of authors on with books about everything, uh, and, and kind of the, you know, the whole world of how we got here through the history of this country. Um, did, did you see if, did you see a factor going through the secret files, uh, of, uh, rampant racism or are these cops that are just, they're, they're just out of control at every level. They don't have any regard for maintaining the integrity that they want to spouse on everyone else. Uh, that's really interesting. I mean, um, uh, certainly there have been, um, reports that, that came out, um, that I, I do talk about in the, in the book, the, the big one that comes to mind, um, uh, and this, um, kind of speaks to another, uh, other side of, of the accountability debate here and whether, um, uh, the oversight is, is really working. Um, so, uh, at one point during, um, late in the de Blasio administration, um, a report came out on, on racial profiling and the NYPD and, uh, uh, the city found that, um, that there had been thousands of complaints of, of racially biased profiling against the NYPD and, and in not a single case, of those over 2000, I believe did that the NYPD internally investigated, did they find the officers at fault? Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, to, to, so, I mean, we, we can talk in theory is the police, is the NYPD racist? Are there racist NYPD officers? Uh, theoretically there must be, but, uh, beyond that, um, you know, those statistics right there speak for themselves that, that at least uh, internally, they um, don't view it as as an issue. Um, this is really quite concerning. I, I don't see how you could have over two thousand complaints uh, on the issue of racial profiling and not a single one resulting in. in good do you have any thought? Do you have any thoughts on does the internal? Um, I forget what they call the internal police that investigate the police. We're supposed to investigate the police. Internal Affairs Bureau. Internal Affairs Bureau. It does do they need to make that more citizen based? Where there's a maybe half and half, or citizens give some oversight to that? Maybe would that help, or does that would that make a difference? So, uh, New York, in fact, has one of the most. Uh, it's probably the most well-funded citizen-based review boards of the police in the country. The mm. CCRB, the C Civilian Complaint Review Board, um, uh, and I, I believe their their funding is well over twenty million dollars annually at this point. And they have a lot of oversight. Their oversight uh, has has been uh, kind of beefed up recently too. The 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 types of cases and number of cases. Uh, that they have purview over. Um, however, uh, it, it's been um, a longstanding criticism about that organization that it's it's a toothless operation that wow. doesn't really have much power. Case in point, in any uh, case that the CCRB investigates, um, uh, the commissioner can come right in and not just overrule them on on discipline. Mm -hmm. uh, disciplinary matters, like their, their, uh, like penalty conclusions, the, the commissioner can come in and, and straight up take the case away from them at any, wow. at any point, which is, um, I mean, it just speaks to the awesome power of, uh, uh, the police brass and the people at the top of the NYPD when it comes to the oversight there. So, mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, I mean, it'll, it'll be interesting to see, uh, if that's something that, that folks want to, to strengthen more in the years to come. There you go. There's the, there's the, there's the, there's the, uh, I don't know, you could call it a weapon, I suppose, that the Justice Department uses, uh, to do these, uh, to these agreements with cities and, and, and counties and I guess states that, that have problems. Uh, I forget what they're called. We had the author writers, the writers come out at night about the Oakland, Corruption in Oakland is one of the cities who's been. What do they call that thing that the Justice Department does? Where it's, so it's called a it's called a consent decree. There you go. 
Yeah. There you go. Does New York need a consent decree from what you researched or, or are they under one? I'd be interested if the Memphis police uh, department was under one that, that uh, killed Tyree Dan- Nichols, in my opinion. Yeah, they are not under one right now. And, and my understanding is that um, uh, that was a, a, a pretty well-oiled machine at the Justice Department during the Obama years. And and uh, when Trump was in office, he pretty much shut it down. And uh, uh, the credit for that goes to, um, uh, I believe, his first Attorney General, Jeff Sessions. They mm. uh, just blanket decided that they weren't going to to do that sort of thing um uh yeah consent decrees uh, uh there's a there's a lot of debate on on both sides um yeah that i would uh i would say oakland is an interesting example and even mm-hmm. more interesting example uh is baltimore and mm-hmm. um uh if you want to learn uh very quickly about sort of the um the challenges that that folks inside the justice department face when they try to come in and do, uh, internal investigations, I would say, go watch, we own this city on HBO or, or better yet read the book. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's a, uh, um, it tends to be, a, a long, arduous, uh, uh, bureaucratic path that, um, uh, a lot of departments resist and, and, and makes it very hard to, um, to, to enact real change. I'm cynical that anything like that would, would work with the NYPD, frankly. Yeah. It's kind of interesting how they, I mean, they've been around, uh, Oakland has the longest one run to my understanding. Uh, and, and they don't seem to really bring the reform that you're supposed to. It's just, it almost seems politics when it comes down to it. Do you, you think that that it's a good question? Do you think, you think, uh, you know, more about this is just about politics. I mean, mayors have to get, they have to get usually, you know, go after union votes or police votes, uh, or union endorsements to get elected and stuff. Is that one of the problems? They, these, these unions just have way too much power. They do. They have, uh, it's an awesome power, but, um, uh, and, and anyone who's listening to this, who's shaking their heads and said, saying the police unions have too much power and, and, and feels discouraged by that. I, I encourage, encourage you to check out the book. And, uh, uh, um, like I was saying before, there's a real story of, of hope here. Um, when you read about the law that was struck down in New York around police discipline and, and secret police disciplinary files. And, um, you know, the, the, the group, um, that led the charge there and, and got, um, uh, the different factions of the, of Democrats in New York to align on it. I mean, they were going up not just against a powerful police union, but 40 years of, of case law and, uh, you know, a union that unlike a, as, as a lobbying force, unlike a lot of unions has the ear of folks across the aisle, right? It's not like they, they just have, right wing Republicans or all Republicans supporting them. They, they have a lot of, of, of Democrats that, that support them, count on support from them. And, and that's where a lot of their power is derived from. Yeah. It's, it's interesting. You know, I, I giggle a little bit because it's so hypocritical, all the stupid stuff we do. I mean, I was, I was talking about the, the Tyree thing and I, I said, you know, you, you get the, you get the government, you get the politicians, you get the police force that you vote in and you support. I mean, until until more of these police officers see that you know uh, courts are going to uphold, juries are going to are going to put them in jail, hold these people accountable. Until they see that, there's there's not going to be much change. And so people have to give a shit. They they have to care about what's going on in their backyard. They can't just be dismissive of like, well, let the police deal with whatever. And as long as I don't have to deal with it no, this is, this is part of your world and, and how you make a difference. You know, and you see people, they don't, they don't care about what happens until it happens to them sort of attitude. I don't know. Isn't there, isn't there a thing for that? I don't care about anything until it happens to me. And maybe there's a, there's a, there's a thing there. Um, but, uh, uh, it's excellent reporting, man. And I'm glad you covered the beat because, you know, your book and, and other things like this that bring transparency is really important so that we, we can really understand more of what's going on and, and, and get more opportunities to resolve these issues. 
Yeah, thanks so much for saying that, Chris. I, I don't plan on stopping anytime soon, so it's uh, it's encouraging to hear that you you like uh, what I'm focusing on. Anything more you want to tease out of the book before we go? No, so this uh, the book is called uh, The Secret Files, Bill de Blasio, the NYPD, and the Broken Promises of Police Reform. And uh, I like to say it's one part searing cop drama, uh, one part in education and how police reform politics went down in New York. So uh, if that's uh, something that interests you, you should go out and pick one up. There you go. There you go. The more you know, the more you know. Uh, thank you very much, Michael, for coming on the show. We really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. There you go. And thanks, Manus, for tuning in. Uh, go order the book wherever fine books are sold. The Secret Files, Bill de Blasio, the New York PD, or the NYPD, I should say, and The Broken Promises of Police Reform. It's available February 21st, 2023 by Michael Hayes. And uh, pick it up today. Uh, thanks to tuning in. Go to YouTube.com, Fortress Chris Foss, Goodreads.com, Fortress Chris Foss. I'll go some Facebook, LinkedIn, and all those crazy places the kids play today. So thank you for being here. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. And that should have a sound.